Most people don't go out and think, I'm gonna assault a policeman today because I'll only get 10 years for it. Bargain. Uh, the news is pretty depressing lately, so to lighten the mood, I've started watching true crime. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Under My Bed. Why am I under my bed, you ask? It's a very good question, just influencer things. Well, I, really I've been thinking, look, how long have we been doing this? 11 years, and I've read, you've gotta keep it fresh, you gotta keep things interesting, spicy. And I thought, what is more unexpected than under the bed? <laughs> No, I'm kidding. Today we're going to be talking about things I'm scared of, which is why we're under the bed. Now I'm no crime aficionado, mainly because I'm a complete fraidy cat. No other reason, really. Honestly, if in my heart of hearts, I think I still kind of believe in ghosts. Every time I drive down a road, I play all the different possible car crashes that could happen every time a car drives past me. And of course, like all millennial women, really hate being in the house at night on my own. However, an exception to this rule has come up a few times in my life and I was really interested in when they came up and why. The first example was in 2017 when, and I can't emphasize this enough, I was in the worst job ever. Can I talk about it on the internet? No, but I will say that I passed Nigel Farage in the corridors several times on a Monday morning and suffice to say it wasn't exactly where I pictured my life going. It was at that exact moment that I discovered, admittedly later than the rest of the world, the podcast Serial and I became obsessed. In fact, something that still to this day bothers me is that if there wasn't a payphone by that Best Buy in 1999, how did he make the call? <laughs> anyway, Serial became my obsession for many months. I would listen to them worryingly back to back and genuinely felt like I was gonna solve the case. And when I left that job, so the desire for true crime left me. Until, until <laughs> March 2020, long story short, Pananini, much stress, little yeast, and I discovered Bailey Serian. Now, if you haven't seen Bailey Serian's work, she is a incredibly glamorous true crime YouTuber who puts on immaculate makeup while sneakily telling you crime stories in this very, I'll tell you the gossip as long as you don't pass it on kind of way. It really sucks you in. She's an incredible storyteller. And for that first lockdown, I was completely addicted. I'm addicted. Q second lockdown, Ashes to Ashes, Life on Mars. Third lockdown, watch the abduction of Lisa McVeigh. Believe me, like three times in a row. Are we starting to see a pattern here? Why is true crime so big? And why did it become bigger at that very moment when the news was already so awful? Why did I become obsessed at these now I see quite predictable intervals with something that usually I have a complete aversion to? Well, I have some theories. I bet you have some better ones. Leave them in the comments below. But here are mine. So if something is that scary, that sad, and often that gross, why wouldn't we want to look away? Why are we looking directly at it for fun. What makes this more or perhaps less confusing, especially when we look at our highly female listeners and watchers index when it comes to true crime, is the fact that women are only 22% of all homicide victims, but they are 70% of the known victims of serial killers, at least within this period, at least within the US. And while I can't find directly comparable stats for other countries, None of the stats that I have seen contradict those kind of proportions. Is it something primal in our brains that knows that something is disgusting, but also has learned subconsciously that we should inspect the disgust to see if there's anything we can learn from for survival? Is it some kind of dark feeling of catharsis? This isn't me. This didn't happen to me. This probably couldn't happen to me. Is it just morbid curiosity? Our minds seeking novelty of some kind? Is it something I would like to coin? The Pseudo urge, <laughs> the urge to work out who did it, 
how and how the mechanics of it work that human urge we have that's made us human that makes us want to take things apart and work out how they work and is there a gendered aspect to that women perhaps are taught more to problem solve to tamper things to find a solution where there isn't a solution and it's all on us whereas men are taught to investigate to be the person steering the helm or the investigation and is women's interest in true crime by the way all the stats i can find on this were incredibly binary so apologies for that but if you have found any stats that I haven't less binary stats I would love to hear them in the comments is our interest in true crime showing that we are actually realizing those skills are transferable and all of the domestic problem solving stuff we've been conditioned to be good at and also all the social intelligence reading people's small signs working out if somebody's angry working out what somebody needs can be transferred into this investigative realm another really interesting stat i found is that women are a complete minority in the law enforcement field but they comprise 78 percent of forensic scientists in the us what? Of course, even if there isn't an answer, I still think there's value in looking back at what we were obsessed with or interested in at certain points, points in our lives and what that might have meant. And it reminded me of a moment in a video I axed. Not every video that I make makes it to this channel. Hashtag artistic process. But I made this video rereading the Twilight series to try and work out why I was one of the many captive, no pun intended, audiences. And this is one of the thoughts I had when I was rereading the part where Edward is watching Bella from her bedroom window outside protecting her, which recognizably as a symbol, as a motif, not ideal, but if we assume the character's reality is the reality that they are experiencing, she is literally on the hit list of an all-powerful vampire who is definitely gonna try and kill her that night. So in that situation, I would kind of insist that my boyfriend sat outside the window and watched out, to be honest. But as I was reading that passage, these are some thoughts that came to my mind. Okay, I don't mean to alarm anyone, but last night, I had a bit of a breakthrough. I was having a little walk, trying to find a space of grass to sit on that wasn't near anybody else. Just more of a challenge than you'd think in pandemic London. Walking around, like I was thinking about how, um, like the kind of all the different places I've lived in London and how differently I felt like walking around different areas. And I used to live in an area where I, I'd get followed home a lot and men like one man actually like grabbed me in the street and i had to like kick him like there just wasn't a day that went past that somebody wouldn't shout at me in the street or like say something that showed that men were watching me they wanted me to know their physical presence was there and it was bigger than me and it was better than me and, and it was more powerful than me it wasn't great for the old mh <laughs> and i'm really grateful now that i live in an area where that doesn't happen that often and even when i found this spot that was like kind of on the side of a wood and i was sitting on a bench and i could still see the road but as soon as it started getting a little bit dark, I started getting really freaked out and uh, like had to leave even though I hadn't finished my book. So that made me think about what I was most afraid of as a teenager. And it wasn't gaslighting because I didn't know what that was at the time. It wasn't that boys wouldn't like me. I'd say that that was like my main obsession. My mind was definitely preoccupied with whether boys liked me or not. But if we go by the assumption that especially in like adolescence, you are nervous attachment kind of realm and you're mainly driven by fears rather than like interests or obsessions, or fantasies or dreams then my main fear was being kidnapped my main fear was having a strange man who i don't know attack me and it's and i wondered whether our our um past and maybe present affection for edward is that he is the ultimate fantasy not because he's beautiful not because he's rich not because he's a vampire but because once you're with edward you're now never going to get gang raped <laughs> Sorry, it's horrible, but like the scene where they're not dating yet, um, but Bella gets followed by this this gang of guys who like have done some horrible stuff to other women in that town and are about to get her. And then Edward is just there and is like get in the car and is constantly watching out for her, never sleeps and has inhuman sensibilities that means that he can hear people coming from absolutely miles away. Hot. <laughs> Somebody who would make it safe for me to walk the streets at night without worrying. Somebody who my mind could defer to when I lay awake at night being like, is tonight the night somebody breaks in and rapes me? <laughs> Which is really horrible and not, not ideal and, you know, maybe not even realistic. But that's like, that's what a lot of the stats about women in the UK say. And it's what a lot of the media is fed us, that, that like we're in danger, that we're going to be hurt. And I can't help but think that maybe there's a part of 
Edward's appeal that we're really ignoring when we think about why teenage girls were so like relieved by the idea of Edward. It's just the thought, it's just the thought I had. It's just the thought. Wow. Now, not to go full on Freud with you, I'm not being funny, but when you were a kid and you were scared of something, what followed? You usually cried and then a comforter came to tell you everything was going to be okay. Now, when that comes to more global things that seem scary to some people, immigrants, vaccines, we are granted, or th those of us who feel comforted by the presence of people like Trump or Boris, we have these kind of parental figures that come in and tell us it's not a big thing, it's fake news, it's all going to be okay, everything is going really well. So the payoff of being scared is direct comfort, simple comfort. And I think our reaction to true crime content and entertainment like spooky stuff is often rooted in our relationship to authority, our relationship to comfort, where that comes from and whether comfort follows fear and how long we're willing to wait for that comfort to be delivered. Or do we want to know how we can deliver that comfort ourselves? When I was in the third lockdown, <laughs> unfortunately the story of Sarah Everard was breaking and that was shaking a lot of the UK. Uh, and also, probably not inconsequentially, I got really obsessed with this documentary slash fictional film that was based on real life called Believe Me, the abduction of Lisa McVeigh. Lisa McVeigh was a teenager who was abducted by a serial killer and convinced him to let her go. While she was being abducted, she managed to remember all these crazy facts about how many stairs she was taken up. Like when she was in the car, she was blindfolded, she knew exactly where they were. And after her escape, she was able to lead the police to the killer's door and then went on to train as a police person herself. There was a darker part of me that wanted to find this aspirational. Obviously she was, she's an incredible woman, but for me to find it aspirational was a little bit weird because obviously we just, like the ideal world is that nobody gets ki kidnapped and nobody should have to have an incredibly almost subhuman skill set to be able to get away. But there was something in me that watched it again because I wanted to learn what she did. I wanted to learn how she interacted with the killer to let her go. I wanted to learn how she was able to remember things and leave clues in the right places. She even like ripped her own finger and started leaving DNA in places he wouldn't wipe them off. I think what shook people about Sarah Everard, of course, rather than the slightly problematic thing that a lot of white women could see themselves in her, was that she was doing all the things that you were supposed to do. You're supposed to text people when you're walking somewhere on your own. You're supposed to wear comfy clothes and running shoes so you can run away. You shouldn't have your hair in a ponytail. Sarah Everard did all these things and bad shit still happened. That is part of what shook everybody about the case. In the next part of that clip that I showed you at the beginning with the comedian Jenna Friedman, um, she says, we don't watch true crime, we study it to make sure we don't end up in it. And part of the narrative arc of true crime isn't just that the crime is committed, it's usually that the crime is investigated and the person gets caught. We love to see it. We fantasize about a dependable expertise team of people looking into a case and working out who it was. Or if you like, an Edward at the window watching over us when there is literally an X on our forehead and a supernatural killer has focused all of his efforts on making sure that you are dead. Another cultural phenomenon that has interestingly sprung up over the last two years is promising young woman. This follows a woman who has seen justice not served and decides to serve it herself. She's been criticised widely for the fact that at the end justice is served in the form of a police arrest and that not being completely coherent with the rest of the narrative, but it is worth mentioning that the writer and the director actually wrote a completely different ending for that film, but was persuaded to change it because of like the money people at the top. <laughs> That's my impression of what I've read about anyway. <laughs> so I don't blame her for that, but I do think it's interesting because it highlights that on some level we want, or at least the film industry thinks we want to see the fantasy that the good guys will catch the bad guys in the end, or that we ourselves have some secret latent smart place <laughs> in our hearts or our brains that will be able to pick out the bad parts of our lives and lock them away 
forever. But because we know if we really sit with ourselves that the bad parts of life don't exist within a single person that you can put handcuffs on and chuck away. And since we know that policing, sentencing, and even the laws themselves are systemically corrupt and designed to adjust the temperature of the punishment depending on factors that are usually outside of the person's control, is that a fantasy we want to be having? If it's about working out how the killer thinks or how those who survive act correctly in order to get away or even prevent it all together, well, I don't know, the thing is, the thing I need to tell third lockdown me is that Lisa McVeigh was exceptional and perhaps that's the problem. So we've already talked in my main character video, which is up here, all about why the tropes of main characters are incredibly useful for short form films, books, TV shows, but an incredibly bad way to assess reality. Just like we talked about in my Sundown video, which is up here, a eh, a eh, joining the dots, it's almost like I had a plan. Holding one person responsible for the failure or success of one piece of art can be kind of inaccurate slash slightly dangerous and I think maybe the same thing comes for murder. All the object through which we think we are going to encounter danger. Now like a lot of people Freud makes me think even if he doesn't make me nod but he has this theory of sublimation. In a very very brief and incomplete and imperfect way it means a lot of us naturally have aggressive or horrible drives but we subconsciously learn sublimation using those dark desires to power good things things that we do. Deep down we know we too have thought about hurting people that have annoyed or hurt us and therefore it pushes us more to support what we perceive as the good guys and encourage their quest to capture them. By following the story, by reading the news articles, by digging into the archives, we feel like we're helping the good guys catch the bad guys or our alternative universe in which we were the bad guys. Yes, catch that bad part of me. Make me believe it never existed. Lock it up somewhere that I don't believe it will ever escape. And if we're part of that progress, do we believe that on some level it absolves us of the desire to do it at all? The guilt of even thinking about it in the first place? I already mentioned this catharsis we might get from knowing that it's not us under the knife, it's not us on the run, and it's also not us being hunted. As I say this, I'm sitting in my shed and I keep hearing footsteps and it's really creeping me out. Is this irony? <laughs> Have I finally found an example of irony in my life? Yes, there is that kind of catharsis, but maybe there's also the kind of catharsis that we see in the Two Minute Hate in Orwell's 1984. Planned, collective, contained hate that is controlled by other people. A collective outlet for anger that is artificially brought on. And of course, true crime is addictive because it has that narrative arc that we crave in our own life the crime is committed, the journey of the hero to go and collect the truth, bring it home, and the criminal is brought to justice. Most of the time we get that and most of the time it's delicious. In a way that maybe we're not getting that in our own lives. The people that we characterised as bad guys in our own lives often get away with it. They might not actually even be bad guys but we have to believe they're bad guys. We never get the validation, we never get thousands of people nodding, yeah you were hurt. And the bad guys in our own personal stories just get to walk around, living their lives, popping up on our Facebook feed, nodding at us in Greg's. And on a wider sense, most of the evils in this world aren't done by one person. They don't have a definite beginning and they're usually ongoing. How irritating, how unsatisfying. Something that Hank Green said in a video has always stuck with me. We think of ourselves as individuals, but the world acts on us as a collective. And that has never been more true when it comes to the pandemic. We realised our individual actions did matter, but the mismanagement of the pandemic often Often made us feel like our individual actions were being made redundant by the governments we lived under. Proving, among many other things in the news right now and for all of time, that there are lots of things going on in the world that aren't the subject of true crime but are in fact true and are definitely crime. Perhaps that's why unfortunately we find it easier to focus on one lone unfortunately usually white victim. I have another video essay in my head that I'll never probably get out. It's all about our hyperfixation on Madeleine McCann, but we'll leave that for now. I bet that video essay has already been written, so if I find it, I'll leave it below. But the whole white women and girls going missing being 
disproportionately represented in the news is like a whole as a whole it's a whole thing it's probably a whole field of study i was listening to this really interesting podcast episode i'll link below about the criminal justice system uh, and the secret barrister was on there he talks about this idea of being tough on crime which is something a lot of our politicians promise us but he says that a lot of the studies show that actually there's no evidence to suggest that raising the maximum sentence is actually stopping people from committing crime because in the most part he says people People commit crime from this complex pool of factors including mental health, alcohol and drug use, ingrained behavioural problems and environmental stressors. Most people don't go out and think I'm gonna assault a policeman today because I'll only get 10 years for it. Bargain. We assume that a lot of crime is premeditated I think because that is what is highlighted in true crime content. Because we assume that we're hunting down real deep 100% evil people who would obviously plan it when in reality we're hunting down really broken people who have lots of mental health problems and are completely unpredictable even to themselves. Doesn't make what they do right but I'm just trying to inspect what is actually happening here. I wrote down this bit from the podcast because it really like hit me on the forehead. The stories we tell ourselves about crime are all too often reduced to the monochrome and the binary. There are innocent angels, either victims or the wrongly accused and the irredeemable villains who we need to punish to adopt a favoured bullshit political phrase to the full extent of the law. We're discouraged from nuance from seeing the complexities in people's lives and we're especially discouraged from seeing criminal justice as something that will affect us. Look, as my favourite radio presenter always says, it is easier to sell tickets for the ghost train than it is the speak your weight machine. Uh, does anybody else have a favourite radio presenter or is that a thing that people don't do anymore? <laughs> Why doesn't anybody have a favourite radio presenter anymore? But perhaps James O'Brien is right, maybe that's just a fact of life and as long as we remember we are at the fair, that it is entertainment, that we are allowed to have fun by untangling the mysteries of the human brain, it is not activism. There's also part of me that doesn't want to be against it because it's so nice <laughs> to see women socialising around something, especially when they make it so much of a more collaborative effort than the kind of lone Hercule Poirot detective <laughs> narrative. There's also a new feminist focus on the victims' lives, of why they mattered to the world and why they will be missed, although then there's the over-justification that like, do you have to be somebody significant for your death to be sad? Sarah Marshall from the You're Wrong about podcast, praise be, um, was talking about why she thinks she loves horror stories and why she's kind of made a career out of researching dastardly tales. I've loved them since I was a teenager and more recently they've become a major pandemic coping strategy for me. In a broader sense, the kind of research I do for this show even falls into that category, I think. Delving into an awful human behaviour and then trying to figure out how the people involved believed it to be a good idea at the time, or what else kept them from making better choices, is a little like watching a Pennywise makeup tutorial. The effect is different when you feel you understand how it is made. So this idea that learning more about true crime and unpicking the intricacies of it kind of defangs the killer, I kind of like that, this idea that there aren't these awful but also powerful and indestructible people wandering around, that they are just people and that they're not magnificent or crazy intelligent is important. I've seen a lot of kind of commentary about how Ted Bundy was held up as this like genius, like he was just so clever, like the way he executed it, when actually it was kind of more complete, really obvious police incompetence and also just pretty privilege. Like that's not, that's not genius, that's just symmetry. Another comfort I found thinking about this topic came at the end of a book we read recently together didn't we? Called Once There Are Wolves. We read that with Maddie, the video is up here. Uh, but at the end there's this um, comment from um, the main character's mum who is a lawyer and she has made a career out of trying to put abusive men behind bars. The main character is asking her how she puts together a timeline to kind of prove that somebody is guilty and then she talks more widely about her career and, and how she really feels about it. She says, yeah people do bad things to each other, 
and we remember those stories. We remember the pain, but remember it because it stands out. It's the blip in the timeline, the thing that doesn't fit. And it's because the rest of the timeline, our whole lives really, are made of kindness. That is what is normal. So normal, we don't even notice it. If we are approaching true crime with this kind of understandable, <laughs> morbid curiosity, and this question in our minds, how could somebody do that? What would bring somebody to do that? Then it means that we largely have lives that disprove that people are nasty inherently. Then those, some of us have led lives where that kind of behavior is an outlier. Lucky us. Thanks for watching the vid, you've done me a solid. This video and all of them on my channel really have been made possible by the Gumption Club. They tip me per video to make sure they keep happening and in exchange I add them to a secret Facebook group where we just talk about life and everything. And I also do a weekly podcast. So if you'd like to get involved in that, I'm gonna leave the link below. If you liked this video, I reckon you might like some of these videos. Do subscribe because it would be a crime not to. <laughs> Frog's not out.